so what we've been talking about is the beginning of the generation of this electrical potential that we create from called an action potential. And this action potential is going to be the signal or represent the signal that's going to be eventually passed into the central nervous system. Uh, we figured out how we use graded potentials to increase the membrane potential to a threshold that causes this full action potential. And so now I want to discuss how we take this action potential and move it physically along a neuron in this direction how we move it along the neuron to eventually get into the nervous system where that information as it comes in, these little packets of information can be processed correctly so that we know we have our hand on the burner or we can see our surroundings. So let's deal with action potential movement along the membrane. Now, at the very end of class uh, on Wednesday, you are all able very well to tell me what happens on this side of the curve versus this side of the curve. So what's, what's happening on this side? Sodium rushes into the cell, causing the membrane to become more positive because we're adding a bunch of positive charged ions. And what's happening over on the other side to bring it back up towards being more negative? Get rid of an ion, right? Positively charged. Task K plus. And that accounts for the drop back down towards the minus 70 millivolts. Okay? Now that's creating current that does work. The work is creating this signal. Because remember that these signals are going to be passed up to the central nervous system. And you, the central nervous system is basically going to get these little blips as action potentials. And they're going to come in. In different sequences and different rates and things like that, and that's the information coded in the from the action potential that's processed by the by the central nervous system. So how do we move it from one location to another? We're basically going to have a starting point. We're going to have a place where the action potential is first generated, and I'm going to call that point of initiation. So that point of initiation typically is some sort of sensory organ or sensory tissue. The reason that you can feel when someone touches you or brushes up against you is because you have these little tiny organs inside of your skin. They're called proprioceptors. These proprioceptors, they respond to that touch. And really what's going on is they respond from a mechanical perspective. You have a mechanical contact that causes those organs that have receptors, those receptors are mechanically deformed, they open up all sodium to rush into the cell. And if the potassium is voltagely triggered to open up, a potassium channel, I should say, is voltagely triggered to open up the potassium leaks. And I've just described what? The creation of an action potential. So that signal is generated. We call that the point of initiation. That signal in the case of the proprioceptor I brush up against you, it's taking the mechanics of me brushing up against you and converting it into the electrical action of the action, <coughs> the exchange of ions across the membrane. <coughs> so from that first action potential at my sensory organ, the next action potentials are responding because we have a voltage-gated sodium channel that opens up that allows sodium to rush into the cell, triggering a voltage-gated potassium channel to open up, which brings the action potential back down. So initially, we're taking mechanical, converting it into electrical, and then electrical to propagate that signal along the neuron from the proprioceptor out in the peripheral tissue back up to the central nervous system. This gives the action potential this appearance that it sweeps along the membrane. And so if I have a membrane that looks like this, 
we have a point of initiation. So you can see here, this is like a, a, a needle or a pin or something. It's interacting with a sensory tissue. In this case, it would just be probably the end of the neuron out in the fingertip or something like that. And that mechanical deformation creates a mechanical to electrical exchange that creates this first initial action potential. And then you have this electrical change that occurs because of the stimulus begin to sweep along the membrane. Okay? So you begin to see that you have action potentials that begin to depolarize the membrane as you sort of step down. Is that, does that make sense? So we're sleeping, sweeping along the membrane. Depolarizing along the way. Now I've really given you just some of the hidden cues here on how we actually form that action potential. And you're all doing really well. You've already given me some really good answers here. Now I want to really put it into context for you and give you some tools that I think will help as you learn this material and try to keep track of action potentials and propagation of that signal. Uh, and we're going to deal with action potential formation. So how are we actually forming the action potential? Remember, we understand how to keep the, re the membrane at its resting potential, and we have to perturb that resting membrane potential. We have to cause that resting membrane potential to reach threshold for an action potential to occur. Think of reaching threshold as increasing the voltage, going from minus 70 to minus 55 milliamps for that action potential to occur. So it's a, the perturbation is an increase in voltage to threshold. What's actually happening when we reach threshold is really the answer to action potential formation. So when you reach threshold, what you see is occurring in the membrane is there's a bunch of proteins in that membrane, and those proteins are called voltage-gated ion chains. So we have these things that are voltage-gated ion channels that are present in the membrane. I want to break that whole name apart because each individual element here is, is going to actually be important. And we're going to start with voltage. And really, I should say we're going to start with voltage-gated. First of all, what's voltage? We measure potential in voltage. Voltage is a difference in electrical activity or electrical concentration or ion concentration across some barrier. Right? A battery has voltage. AA battery is 1.5 millivolts. And that means that there's a difference in the potential to move electrons from one side of the battery to the other side at 1.5 volts. The membrane potential, what's the resting membrane potential? Minus 70 millivolts, that means that we're minus 70 millivolts or 70 millivolts or negative inside of the cell. So we have this depolarization across the membrane where we're more negative inside, less negative outside. So that's voltage. Something that's voltage gated, that door is mechanically gated. And what that means is I have to go over to it and to open the, the door up. I have to do something mechanical. In this case, I have to push down on the handle and I have to open the door. Okay? A voltage gated channel needs voltage or a change in voltage needs to be exposed to a change in voltage in order to open up. So, this idea of threshold we're going from minus 70 millivolts up to minus 55 millivolts to reach the threshold that's a change in voltage. That change in voltage is what is responsible once you get to plus or minus 55 millivolts. The change from minus 70 to minus 55 is going to open up the voltage gated channel. So, voltage gated just simply means that that particular protein that when it is open makes the membrane permeable opens in response to voltage. <coughs> Thank you. 
And I'm going to call voltage here by its other name, which is potential. So a change in membrane potential. And the reason I'm doing that is because we're talking about two different potentials. The resting membrane potential, and we change to the threshold potential. And when we make that change in voltage from membrane potential to threshold potential, it's enough change in voltage for these proteins to be opened up. And literally, you can think of it opening up. This is the membrane, right? This is a protein in that membrane. Right now, it's not permeable. I try to go through the door, I'm not going to make it. If it was a voltage gated channel, I'd go from minus 70 millivolts to minus 55 millivolts to my resting membrane potential to my threshold potential. And that door will be caused to swing open. Okay? So think about a door as we go through this. It swings open and it goes full open. And what can happen when it's full open? If it's a door, you and I can leave. If it's a membrane in a channel, I am not to be And then the door begins to swing back shut. And once it's fully shut, not, nothing becomes, it becomes impermeable again. So these voltage-gated channels, it's a gate because basically gate blocks an opening. The channel, when it is open and not blocked by the gate, is an opening through that membrane. So that's the voltage-gated portion of the voltage-gated ion channel. You all should know ion. What's ion? Ion is a charged particle, and we have two that we're dealing with here. They're sodium and they're potassium. Sodium has a positive charge, and potassium has a positive charge. Now, what you need to know about these voltage gated ion channels, just like most of the proteins that we have in the biological system, they are really, really selective. And what I mean by that is they only allow a certain material to cross. We could call this door very selective. And when it opens up, maybe it's a mechanically gated female door. And I go over there and I try to open it up, and boom, I run right into it because I can't get it to open up because I'm not female. But then one of her ladies walks over there and swings right open and allows the ladies up. So it's selective for the, for the ladies in the room, guys who are going to hang out for a while. Unless we have a male gated or a uh, mechanically gated male channel through the, through the wall, and then you can cross. So when we talk about voltage gated channels, that's a description of a bunch of different channels. And what we're going to find out is that there are sodium, voltage gated sodium channels, voltage gated potassium channels. The sodium channels are only allow sodium, potassium channels only allow potassium. So sodium and potassium ions charge particles. And last channel, channel think channel channel between rivers or between lakes. It's a pathway between two different locations. Right? So we call it a channel. It's really a protein, and that protein. When it is opened up, allows easy passage through the membrane. Now, easy, that's supposed to be easy passage. Easy passage through the membrane. Easy is a very important word there. And why is easy a very important word? Does potassium cross the membrane even if it doesn't go through a channel? Does, but not near as quickly as it does when the channel is open. And that's very common in membrane biology. I might have a membrane, and I might have some sort of channel. And let me give you an example of water. Water will cross through the membrane, not very easily. Which makes sense because the membrane inside here is significantly or highly hydrophobic. Water doesn't like to be in places where there's a high level of hydrophobicity. So water does cross through, but it's at a low rate. So what is the low rate? 
It's about a hundred thousand molecules in the cell. Mm -hmm. Some people are like molecules. There's a protein called an aquaporin. Literally means water. The aquaporin can be produced to be put into the membrane to cause the membrane to be permeable to water. So water can go through here about a hundred thousand times a second, or water can go through an aquaporin when an aquaporin is available. And it makes it even faster. In that aquaporin, you have a trillion molecules of water, all single files, crossing every single. So we go from 100,000 to a trillion. A trillion all that can make a trillion molecules in a second, as opposed to 100,000. So that's what we're saying when it's easy. You now have massive quantities of that solute, of that sodium or that potassium, that cross in a short amount of time. And they cross so quickly that we can instantaneously change voltage from minus 70 millivolts up to our minus 55 to reach threshold. Then we get the threshold in, in a millisecond, faster than I can snap my fingers. We're at plus 30 millivolts because all the sodium is just brushed into the cell. So it crosses much easier. All right, so action potentials. What you're looking at here in this figure is you have the membrane basically at four different time points. One, two, three, four. Okay? And then right here in the middle, you'll also see you have one, two, three, four. And drawn out here in red is the action potential. Drawn out here in orange is the current of sodium. And then drawn out here in the green is the current of potassium. So you'll notice. Here at 1, we're at resting membrane potential. We're not changing voltage at all. There's not been a stimuli that's going to bump stuff up towards threshold so that we can go for full action potential. So what we're doing here is we're maintaining the charge on the battery. You know, we have the leak. The sodium crosses through, the potassium crosses back out. We have that leak, and then we just pump it out to our uh, sodium potassium pump to maintain high levels of sodium, uh, high levels of sodium outside of the cell low levels of sodium inside the cell, high levels of potassium inside the cell, shown here, and the sodium shown here, and no sodium or potassium on here, no sodium on here. So that sodium channel is initiated. So we have some sort of stimuli that causes that sodium channel to open up. In other words, you have a stimuli that increases the voltage changes the voltage from resting membrane potential to threshold potential. That stimuli leads towards threshold potential, which is a description of the opening of those sodium channels. When threshold is reached, when we get to that minus 55 millivolts, all of those sodium channels open up and sodium begins to pour into the cell. Now, as sodium pours into the cell because the gate is open, which is what's being shown here, so the gate's closed here, the gate is open here, sodium begins to rush into the cell, you get a sodium current. Right? Sodium comes into the cell, and we have a massive increase in the voltage. So this is a measurement of the sodium coming into the cell, the actual quantity of sodium, and this is the electrical current that's generated by the sodium process. There's actually another threshold. The second threshold is going to cause the potassium channel to open up. And it's achieved because the sodium rushes into the cell, increasing the voltage across that membrane. Sodium is going to begin to enter the cell. And you can see that that basically begins uh, shortly after we've increased sodium. So sodium begins to increase. Potassium, shortly after that, begins to increase. Sodium begins to de decrease, potassium remains increasing and goes through the whole, the whole thing and begins to now decrease. And so we go through this whole electrical signal from the action potential. So let's get it all in your notes now. And we're going to start at the resting membrane potential. So this is the cell that is rest. It's maintaining, it's being maintained to stay charged. So that we have the difference in the sodium and potassium concentrations across the membrane. Then we're going to have some sort of some sort of stimuli that interacts with the cell.
Now, that stimuli, it has to cause a change in voltage. And the way that a lot of stimuli causes this initial change in voltage to go from resting membrane potential to threshold potential is to cause a small number of very sensitive sodium channels to open. Now, the small number of channels is going to be graded. In other words, what I'm saying is the number of channels that open up is going to depend on how strong and how frequent that stimuli comes in. So if I just have a really small stimuli, if this is my action potential curve, here's my, uh, my threshold. Stimuli comes in here, oops, that should be an arrow. So stimuli comes in, it's a relatively small stimuli. I get a little blip, nothing happens, I don't reach threshold. Another possibility is I could have relatively small stimuli, about the same size as this stimuli, but they come in frequently, and I get that summation pattern. And I get very close to threshold and maybe I don't quite make it, so I just speed it up, and there's no response. These are electrical responses because of this small number of sodium channels. Each hump, more and more of these sensitive sodium channels are being poked up. So you kind of think about this in like a perspective of we have a small number of really, really, really sensitive sodium channels. And then we have another group, small group of really, really sensitive sodium channels. And then another small group of really, 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 or really, really, really small sensitive sodium channels. And then we have a much larger group of insensitive channels that are responding to the voltage created by these really, 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 and really, really, really sensitive channels. So we have a small number of channels that open up. If I bring in a big stimuli, I might open up a larger number of sodium channels. If I bring in two big stimuli, now I have enough stimulation to get to that point where it's going to interact with those insensitive sodium channels. And they open up, and there's billions of them. So now large quantities of sodium can cross into the cell. So we go from this small number of channels opening up and having a minimal influx of sodium to reaching the threshold, and then we open up enough channels to cause the action protection. Now, when I have multiple stimuli, multiple stimuli end up with a slightly larger number of those channels that are caused to open. That means a slightly larger signal. And as long as I'm opening channels to stay below the threshold, nothing's going to happen. If I open up enough channels where I reach threshold or I exceed threshold, at that point, I'm going to have many sodium channels open up. And in fact, I can say that in a given section of membrane, so if we're just observing this section of membrane, we're not observing any of the other parts of the membrane, we're just looking at this one little patch of membrane, I might be able to look at the density of sodium channels in there and I might find, um, you know, let's say 100,000. Let's make it easy. Let's say we find a thousand sodium channels in there. I may open up ten of them of the thousand because they're the really, really sensitive ones. Then when I get to threshold, all one thousand of them open. Which is really interesting because that means that every time I reach threshold, all of them open, I can't create bigger action potentials. I always create the exact same size action potential. We're all in every time we create an action potential. And we're going to get to that principle in a little while, but just kind of foreshadowing that a little bit. Once you get the threshold, not only is it many sodium channels, in that little patch of membrane that's about to depolarize, all of them, every single sodium channel opens up. 
in one sense, when you reach threshold, it's kind of like swinging open a door really hard. Those channels, their door, their gate swings open. People rush out, or the sodium ions rush out of the out of the intracellular fluid, and then the door swings all the way open and begins to swing shut, and freezing is closed, and then sodium influx stops. So we see this increase in sodium as the gates swing open, and then we begin to see sodium influx decrease as the gates shut. And pretty soon we are back down to zero, no sodium influx because the gates are closed. So up to this point, once we get the threshold, now we're going to have many of the sodium channels open up. All of the sodium channels in a specific patch of membrane that's responding to a threshold potential. This creates our depolarization, which you remember in that figure, depolarization is on the left. It's this portion of the curve. We're becoming less and less polarized, heading towards zero. So we're just simply going to call it depolarization. It's created by sodium influx into the cell. And so if you look at the intracellular fluid, or in this case I'm going to call it the cytoplasm, basically if you look at the, the solution inside of the cell, because we're adding a whole bunch of sodium and carrying its positive charge, we're going to increase that cytoplasm in charge. When a sodium channel is triggered to open, a voltage-gated sodium channel is triggered to open, that door begins to swing open and it swings shut. Just like this door, I can swing the door open now, and it's not going to just stay open unless I go through the wall. It's going to swing open and then it's going to swing back shut. So the sodium channel, the gate begins to swing open, and as soon as it begins to swing open, sodium, <laughs> sodium ions begin to seep through and they continue to get through as long as the gate is open wide enough for them to cross. So the channel gate swings open. Sodium begins to cross, continues to cross, and then sodium begins to shut. The sodium channel, I should say, begins to shut. So channel gate swings open, and it begins to swing shut. And the whole time it's open, as long as it's open enough. So here it's open, it's beginning to shut, it's fully shut, sodium no longer can enter into the cell. So we lose our sodium influx. In terms of how this happens in our, um, in our membrane with these sodium channels, the whole process causes us to go from that minus 70 millivolts through the plus 50, minus 55 millivolts up to around plus 35 millivolts in the nerve. <clears throat> so we'll have enough sodium <clears throat> that crosses the membrane in this short amount of time. Notice the time down here, by the way, is milliseconds. One millisecond, two milliseconds, everything's over. So within that kind of half a millisecond time, we have enough sodium that enters the cell to depolarize the cell from minus 70 millivolts through threshold up to about plus 35 millivolts. So this is going to be the top of the peak. Now, during this process, the sodium channel as we go through this change in voltage, we get over here toward between two and three. Sodium's crossing, potassium's not, but the potassium channels, they're also voltage gated. They're now experiencing really different voltage. We're almost at plus 35 millivolts. And in fact, once we get right around zero millivolts, right around in this part of the curve, those potassium channels begin to open up their hands. 
in response to the, to the voltage. So the potassium threshold, the potassium channel threshold must be right around zero millivolts. So our potassium channels open up. Same thing. Gate swings open. As long as the gate is open big enough, sodium, I'm sorry, potassium is crossing through. Now, at some point, potassium is going to become the predominant ion crossing the membrane. When that happens, we're going to begin to have re uh, repolarization. We're going to begin to go from that kind of positive above zero voltage back down towards minus 70 millivolts. So we have repolarization, which is accounted for by open potassium channels allowing potassium out outflow. So in terms of the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm or the intracellular fluid, results in a decrease in charge. So charge here, the red line begins to decrease back out towards our minus 70 millivolts. Now, just like with the door, I swing it open, it begins to swing back shut. So as the potassium channel, as the gates of the potassium channel swing shut, eventually I'm going to eliminate potassium flow. I'm now at this point in the figure. Now what I want you to notice here is that I actually get below minus 70 millivolts. Okay? So we have kind of this section of the curve. So I release enough potassium from the inside of the cell that I actually go below minus 70 millivolts. More, more like minus 75 or minus 80 millivolts. That's called hyperpolarization. The reason it's called hyperpolarization is because we're even more polarized than we are at resting membrane potential. Now, what do I need to do here? I need to recharge this patch of membrane just like I need to recharge a battery. So I want to make sure that I get my ions distributed on the right side of the membrane. You'll notice that at the very end of this process, um, all of my sodium would be inside of the cell, all of my potassium would be outside of the cell because I've just exchanged it. So now I need to bring all of my sodium back in, and I need to bring uh, all, I'm sorry, I need to bring all of my sodium back out of the cell, I need to bring all of my potassium back to the cell. That goes back to how do we maintain the rest of the membrane potential. You'll remember that we have these things called sodium potassium pumps. They are basically always on and always work. Even during an action potential, they're still working to bring sodium back out of the cell and potassium back into the cell. However, when these channels open up, there are so many more of those channels than the, uh, than the, the sodium potassium pumps that those sodium potassium pumps just basically get overrun and you can't even see the effects of bringing the sodium back in. So during that hyperpolarization stage, you can see that we slowly drift back up towards resting membrane potential as those sodium potassium pumps are now working again or can, can seem to be working because we shut down our channels that are allowing sodium potassium to cross. So our resting membrane potential is re-established. And this would be the end of the action potential. Now, that patch of membrane may need to go through another action potential relatively quick. Remember, this is just the way that we're getting those packets of information, the action potential, to move along the membrane up towards the central nervous system, right? So this is basically kind of like, here's the road I need to travel, I need to get here, and the way I do it is I create an action potential here, and an action potential here, and an action potential here, and they sort of move along until I get to here. But I may want to move, send up multiple impulses. So a set of 
action potentials moving along that point would just be basically a single a si single signal being transmitted into the central nervous system. If I want to send a second signal, I need to go through, and I'll put it in red, and I need to regenerate action potentials all along that membrane. And that would be a second signal that comes in. Does that make sense? So it's basically kind of like if I were to say, hey, here are my notes, Sarah, and I give them to her, and then she takes everything out, and she passes the information on here to Andrea, and then passes it on here to the So it's kind of passing the information along. Now, it would be kind of saying, okay, here you go. Here's some information. Pass it along. Here's some more information. Pass it along. Here's some more information. Pass it along. And it just keeps on getting passed along from the point of initiation. So we always have to recharge the membrane, but we have to, we have a, a rule that we need to play on. Remember that this portion of the curve, I said it was all or none. We are all in. All sodium channels are open. So what if I bring a stimuli in right here? I don't have any other sodium channels that I can open up, so I can't begin to generate that next piece of information to pass it along. This idea is called refractor. And there are actually two different refractory periods. The one that I just showed you, I have all of my sodium channels committed to creating this first signal, is called the absolute refractory period. The other is going to actually occur here during hyperpolarization, and it's going to be called relative refractory period. So what is this idea of a refractory period? During an action potential, so in the middle of this action potential, because I've committed all of my sodium channels to being open to cause that action potential to occur, I cannot cause other action potentials to be generated. Or at least, typically, they are not generated. Now, I said there were two types. The first type is absolute, and it is absolutely not going to happen. There's no, not going to be another action potential that begins to be created here during an action potential. Okay, so the two types of refractory periods are going to be absolute, which occurs during the action potential, and then relative, which occurs basically once the action potential gets back down here towards threshold and towards um, dressing membrane potential, and then throughout this undersheerly hyperpolarization. So our absolute refractory period, no action potential is formed. No matter how big the stimuli, so no matter how big the stimuli or how big uh, another you know action potential neighboring that neighboring portion of the membrane that triggers that portion of the membrane, no matter how big that stimuli or that change in voltage is, doesn't matter. Absolute refractory is always going to occur when the membrane is above threshold. So from right here to right here is absolute refractory. Every in that little patch of membrane, every sodium channel, every potassium channel, totally involved. I can't open any other, I can't make the membrane any more permeable to those ions. <clears throat> the relative refractory period is the usually no action potential is generated. So usually there is no second action potential, which by the way, that second action potential 
would basically stack up right here, right, and boom, right through there. So I'd just be shortening the time between individual action potentials of that captured membrane that's being depolarized. This, you will understand, is that potassium channels are open here, but sodium channels are not. So I actually have sodium channels that I can open up. And as long as I've moved enough sodium back across the membrane to revert the sodium concentrations to the right sides of the membrane, as long as I have that sodium available, and as long as the sodium channels are available, if it's a big enough stimuli, so basically if I can go from that minus 80 millivolts and the stimuli is big enough to get the threshold, I can open up those sodium channels again and begin to create a second action. So we need a big stimuli in order for that gap to be to be crossed between resting membrane potential or really hyperpolarization potential and then back up to threshold potential. So our relative refractory period is going to occur during hyperpolarization. In other words, when you're less than minus 70 millivolts, so when you're right in this area here. Actually, that's the wrong way for this to be. So I want it to be back in the minus 80 minus 90 millivolts. <coughs> When we're trying to get back to resting membrane potential, when we're rebounding the resting membrane potential. Everybody got everything they need here? So now that we kind of get the idea how we can generate action potentials and we get the idea how we're going to move those action potentials along with little packets of information that are eventually going to make their way into the central nervous system, that information comes in, the central nervous system starts going, okay, there's an action potential from such and such receptor in my hand, here's another one, there's another one that are coming in pretty quick, oh, I think the hand is on the burn. What do I need to do? It's getting the information in and it's processing. processing. Then it sends information back out. By the way, that information being sent back out, you already know how it works because it's action potential being sent down, sent down motor nerve to the muscle to cause the muscle to respond to contract. What I want to do now is talk about some of the characteristics that we see with action potentials. And there are two principles that I want to introduce you to. The two principles are principle, uh, I'm going to call them principle one and principle two. The two principles uh, deal with the, the, the action potential itself. Action potentials always fall, follow an all or none principle. So principle number one here of action potentials is all or none principle. If you ever watch competitive poker on ESPN on a Saturday morning, and you're really bored with life, you'll know that sometimes they push all the chips in and say, I'm all in. Every time an action potential is created, they put everything into it. They push in all of their sodium channels. So every single time a specific patch of membrane is depolarized, goes to an action potential, because it's all in, that action potential looks exactly the same every time that patch of membrane goes through an action potential. That's the idea of the all or none principle. You can't have little small action potentials in response to small stimuli and bigger action potentials in response to big stimuli. You get the same stimuli, or I'm sorry, the same action potential regardless of strength of stimuli. As long as you meet threshold, we go all in. And it's an all or nothing. 
or all or none principle. Another way to put this all or none principle is action potentials are either going to occur or they do not occur. They're not like, oh, that feels like a 30 week stimuli. It's either I didn't get the threshold, so I'm going to remain at resting memory potential, or I just see a threshold, bam, all the way through my full action potential. So the, the way that this really comes out in uh, experimental setup is every time you measure the wave formation of an action potential. So every time we experimentally stimulate it around and we measure that action potential form, that waveform, they're always identical. And what I mean by that is the width of the wave, which is a measure of how quickly the action potential occurred, and how tall it is, what we call the amplitude of the wave, is identical. I can literally take multiple um, action potentials from the same patch of membrane over, I mean, years, and they're always the same. Boom, 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 right on, Right on top of each other. Okay, so that's the all or none principle, principle number one. Principle number two is self propagation. Action potentials are self propagating, and what that means is once we create an action potential, the next action potential, or the next patch of membrane, I should say, is stimulated to create an action potential by the neighboring patch of membrane. So this action potential causes this patch of membrane right next to it to cause another action potential that causes this patch of membrane to cause another action potential. So self propagates And so this gives us the appearance that we have action potentials that move in a wave down the membrane. And that signal or that information of action potentials move along the membrane at a constant speed with a constant amplitude. Constant speed and constant amplitude. So if I turn the light off here in the ring, right now through that circuit, there's no electron. And then I turn it on, and the speed of those electrons crossing from one side of the, of the circuit to the other side of the circuit is a constant speed and it's a con constant amplitude. They measure that amplitude and the current's not fluctuating real big, or it should be at least. So our action potential moves down at this constant speed, constant amplitude being caused or being created by the previous action potential down the, the membrane from the physical location. Am I out of time? I'm out of time. All right, so I have just a small amount of material left to cover. Um, so we'll pick up with that on Monday and getting ready for the test conference. Monday after your break.